to stand here in front of you today. On the one hand, I'm flattered and honored by the chance to talk in this series of lectures devoted to one of the crucial challenges of our discipline. On the other hand, however, I also share that uncanny feeling of having been banned from the idyllic paradise of literature and literary studies. A pernicious situation which forces us to look for a new homeland or more programmatically, to reconquer our territory. In this respect, however, I will undoubtedly disappoint you, since I do by no means consider myself a Moses nor a Messiah. Instead, I will attempt to articulate some preliminary ideas which might contribute to a better understanding of this profound feeling of crisis and which may eventually lead to some strategical moves in order to remedy the ongoing spiral of decline. Why literary studies matter now? Academic practices in an anti-intellectual climate. The title of these Ringvorlesungen is not only fascinating and intriguing, it may also be considered symptomatic of the critical situation of literary studies nowadays in various respects. And since I have no PowerPoint, what you see is what you get. First of all, the title underlines our, the serious challenges our society is currently confronted with. This diagnosis of the present climate as anti-intellectual is obviously pessimistic, notwithstanding the fact that numerous scholars, not only historians, economists and physicians, but also social psychologists, such as Steven Pinker, have demonstrated the undeniable human, economic and social progress throughout history. Yet, a growing number of people share the impression that this optimistic turn has changed drastically in recent years. That our comfortable Western way of living and of living together stands under tremendous pressure. Anthropocene thinkers have confronted this with the radical marginality of humankind and its disastrous effects on cosmic life. The foundations of our age-old democracy are under attack in this age of populist thinking, emotional individualism and fake news. The regime of post-Fordian capitalism is on the verge of collapse as both the financial crisis and the globalist economic reorganization testify. And finally, our steady belief in rational reasoning and in a well-defined identity in terms of race, nationality, class, gender and age is clearly on the way as well. It is an overall depressing picture, especially in the context of New Year's wishes for happiness, bodily and spiritual health and prosperity. Moreover, this anti-intellectual climate is linked explicitly to the status and the function of literature, both within and outside of the context of academia. Literature currently faces new major challenges as well. It has lost its self-evident cultural and societal prestige in this media-oriented era for the greater part. And for many observers, it remains even doubtful whether literature, as we've known it for several centuries, will ultimately survive these drastic changes at all. At the same time, however, all actors, readers but also writers and various types of mediators, still have extremely high expectations for the role literature must presumably play in our present society. 
how on earth are we to combine those antagonistic, dystopian as well as utopian views on literature. And finally, the very purpose of our discipline is questioned as well. Can or should literary studies remedy those negative inclinations in society? In what ways can scholars and students come to the rescue of fundamental beliefs and values which are criticized today, in spite of the fact that they have dominated our ongoing thinking about literature, culture and society without a hitch for a very long time? Do we need other approaches, other theoretical concepts, other literary corpora to sustain such new perspectives? Or can we rely safely on what was achieved in the past? In the final analysis, this set of questions points to the very task of literature studies as such. Do literary scholars have to diagnose ongoing societal problems? Are they expected to offer an in-depth analysis or do we expect literature scholars and maybe literature as such to come up with real solutions for our impasses? Or conversely, is the initial question this series of lectures confronts us with in itself already a symptom of our dominant pragmatist thinking which demands specific uses, targets, strategies and aims in line with neoliberal efficiency in contrast to the old Kantian belief in aesthetic non-servitude or even radical disinterest. As you can see, the questions which orient these lectures are very ambitious, if not outrageously megalomaniac. They could have arisen from the Twitter account of some American president. In my lecture, I will merely endeavor to elucidate some of the presuppositions underlying this feeling of profound crisis in the study of literature. My tentative suggestions will, not surprisingly, point to some promising recent tendencies in our research. But at the same time, I will advocate a somewhat conservative view on literary studies as well. In fact, Although I have an outspoken interest in new critical theory, as a literary historian, I feel rather hesitant about the very drastic reorientation of our research in order to give in to all sorts of timely objections. More specifically, the sudden programmatic stress on contemporary so-called urgent literature is also based on particular poetic presuppositions. And as a consequence, its normative and historical presumptions have to be analyzed meticulously as well. In order to illustrate some of my arguments, I will in the last part of my lecture refer to contemporary Dutch poetry. On the one hand, this offers me the opportunity to promote a minor but very dynamic literary landscape. On the other hand, however, I'm quite convinced that my examples can be generalized to other cultural situations quite easily. But first things first. I think it is advisable to analyze our critical diagnosis of literature and literary studies nowadays in more detail. As a matter of fact, pessimistic views on the quality and the sense of literature have been formulated time and again throughout history, from the Roman complaints about the dubious level of their decadent contemporaries in comparison to the glorious past onwards. One could even argue that the dynamics of modern literature is to a large extent ultimately based on the pitched battle between the prestigious literary tradition and various forms of so-called anti-literature, ranging from new genres or new themes to the destructive avant-garde or playful postmodernism. Some critics and readers assume, for instance, that the great epic tradition is no longer viable in the 21st century whereas others complain about the rather low standards of today's poetry in comparison to the major achievements of former generations. Such often fierce discussions about the value of particular literary practices, genres and texts constitute an inherent part of literary dynamics. 
they help participants to legitimate particular hierarchies and selections. They contribute to canonization and marginalization processes. They hint at emerging innovations and so on. Yet, nowadays, such critical remarks not only question specific literary phenomena, quite on the contrary, they aim at literature in its entirety, even including the social relevance of the literary tradition. Hence, it would be unwise to dismiss this ongoing controversy as the umpteenth variation on that general pattern of literary discussions. In this case, the very existence of literature as a prestigious cultural domain is at stake. On closer consideration, this overall devaluation of literature is related to two complementary dimensions. On the one hand, literary scholars as well as the general public have stressed the impact of certain external institutional changes. On the other hand, however, they also discern fundamental internal revolutions within the domain of literature itself, changes that have even intensified the ongoing process of marginalization. The same discussions about literature and literary practices are moreover mirrored in the field of literary studies, resulting in both a disciplinary and an institutional crisis. First, the institutional crisis. Institutionally, literature seems to have lost most of its former social and cultural prestige. For a long period of time, literature had in fact played a primordial role in the global organization of culture and society, and hence in the entire educational system. Pupils were introduced to the uh, peculiarities of literature already when entering school, and in secondary education, they got familiar with the established national canon as an essential component of their personal and social development, considered even more vital than science or mathematics. The esteemed interest in classical languages and history reinforced this shared belief in education as a form of building, and building as a project of establishing one's own identity. These literary experiences comprised a large number of practices and various forms of knowledge. A range of reading strategies, of course, but also the use of a specific meta-language to discuss texts. This attention was grounded in the common conviction that literature not only offered a unique means to learn languages in depth, but that such a mastery of language in all its aspects was crucial to become a worthy citizen. Moreover, there was a central agreement about the central role literature was supposed to play in constricting ethically responsible and self-conscious humans, in establishing all kinds of social relations, love and marriage included, in enhancing the national collective identity of a people. Reading capacities but also a thorough familiarity with the canonical repertoire were generally considered essential materials for the formation of young people. This same unshakable belief in the emancipatory merits of literary education penetrated literary criticism as well as the literary conceptions of both writers and avid readers. Some decades ago, however, this normative ideal got less and less self-evident. Education tended to see mathematics and science as the motor of self-development and social mobility. Expertise, literacy and citizenship no longer coincided with the cultural elite. Culturally speaking, discourses on literature lost their social prestige because other topics ranging from economic investment to fashion and sports, became more popular, yet no longer non-prestigious topics of conversation. In a desperate attempt to counter this lack of interest, literary practices were inclined to cherish brand new and eye-catching phenomena, rather than presenting once again the old-fashioned canon. 
this noxious evolution was reinforced by the ongoing process of medialization. All kinds of media got fascinated by stars and influencers, and hence the superficial personal interview replaced the in-depth book review, portraying authors as media stars or as public intellectuals, but no longer as authors. Nevertheless, sociological investigations agree that the literary participation rate is dropping rapidly, both quantitatively and qualitatively. People tend to consume, buy and read fewer books than in the past. Youngsters share preferences in music, fashion or television series rather than a common repertoire of literary texts. Bestsellers still do exist, but their impact remains fleeting. Moreover, such titles no longer reflect the established cultural hierarchies, Fifty Shades of Grey. When people continue to read, they are reading the wrong books, at least according to the cultural elite, a very small and defensive intellectual elite, which no longer finds its opinions reflected in most newspapers and other dominant media. In short, literature is present abundantly in today's society, but it lacks institutional support and structural distribution. Most bookshops only present a very small segment of the global production, and their strict business model hardly offers any opportunities for difficult genres or marginal experimental literature, nor for keeping older titles in stock. On the other hand, due to the far-reaching explosion of the internet and the social media, virtually anyone can become a creative writer or a literary critic. The first category is to be found massively on websites which collect fan fiction or occasional poetry. The second flourishes on the social media or websites such as goodreads.com. Next to these extrinsic institutional factors contributing to literature's fall in present times, however, there are also intrinsic factors which have affected the very essence of literature seriously. As a matter of fact, literary studies, we, have turned this crisis of its object into one of our own central themes. Numerous scholars have written about the end, or more dramatically, the death of literature. Historical considerations about the evolution of modern literature are combined with programmatic ideas about the manner in which literature is supposed to handle the big issues of an ever-changing society. The French scholar William Marx, for instance, wrote a rather pessimistic historical account about the decline of French literature in the 20th century, whereas his Dutch colleague, Thomas Vasses, rather triumphantly proclaimed the death of postmodernism and the emergence of urgent literature. Notwithstanding their fundamentally different approach, both scholars hold literature largely responsible for its own decline and its loss of social and cultural relevance. More in particular, they analyze the fundamental shift which resulted from the fiasco of deconstructive criticism and postmodern literature to deal with major problems in Western society. In their analysis, they use the terrorist attacks of 9-11 as a symptomatic shibboleth. Historically speaking, the emergence of so-called modern literature during the 20th, 19th and 20th century is associated closely with the then ongoing transformation of society into a set of separate function systems. Since religion, law, science, philosophy and other specialized domains of knowledge became self-sufficient and structured by means of unique discourses and institutions, the overall ambition of literature as a means of building, which had maintained itself over the centuries, came under pressure. Hence, modern authors such as Baudelaire or the so-called atheists in Dutch literature programmatically refused all kinds of ideological or moral guidelines from bourgeois society. Instead, 
They established literature as a function system of its own, a unique means of protest, but first and foremost, a unique playground for artistic experiments. Art, for art's sake, became the slogan of this new literature, thereby transforming the position of the writer as a spokesman for society into that of an observer or an outsider. In addition to this refusal of all so-called extra literary constraints, modern authors concentrated on the exploration of literature's specific medium, language, as a privileged means of expression, but especially as a universe for the exploration of the individual self and the world. Thus, the naive mimetic discourses of realism and the idealist normative messages were replaced by literature's endless search for a purified and pure language, with Mallarmé as an idol and poetry as the model genre. Moreover, reproaches of writing needlessly hermetic and elitist were countered by legitimating strong boundaries between genuine so-called highbrow literature and despicable lowbro forms of cultural behavior. During the subsequent revolutions of avant-gardism, modernism, neo-avant-gardism, and eventually postmodernism, the ideal of a reader's writer, whose success was measured by the volume and the eagerness of the reader public, the reader's writer turned into that of the seclusive poet's poet, writing for a very small inner circle of fellow experimentalists. Literature was supposed to refrain from that ability, referencing to reality, formulating pre-existing truths. Instead, it concentrated on so-called writable texts, on fictionalization and unnaturality, on exploring forms and all sorts of language games. However, this process of radical artistic distinction lost its self-evident character by the end of the 20th century, due to a conglomeration of factors in society, in arts, in the media, and finally in literature itself. The loss of its primordial place in culture entailed a fundamental shift in literary appreciation. Cultural hierarchies were no longer considered naturally given, and even the very idea of a transhistorical and universal canon as a model got contested because of its aestheticist and decontextualized ideology. Instead, many participants, the reader public, but also a growing number of critics and scholars, asked for a type of literature that could once again play a decisive role in the problems society saw itself faced with. Today, this view on urgent literature, destined for a broad readership, intended as middle bro rather than the despised high bro literature, and aiming explicitly at the transformation of ideas and opinions, has in fact become quite dominant, also in academic circles. A similar evolution can indeed be observed in our discipline as well. And now I transform the argument from literature to literary studies. This evolution hardly comes as a surprise, since the close bond between the object and the discipline is not uncommon in the humanities. In fact, this interrelation works both ways. On the one hand, scholars construct an object in accordance with their priorities, for instance, by selecting a preferable corpus and simply omitting other data as less relevant or even as not literary. On the other hand, the literary practices we are confronted with will inevitably influence our research questions and the mythologies deemed best suited to tackle those. During the high days of modernist and avant-garde literature, the perspective of the canon changed drastically, since innovative literature was seen as crucial for the self-definition of literature. Similarly, the discipline and the education of literary studies concentrated on close reading, on laying bare the essential, which is linguistic and stylistic, characteristics of valuable literature, independent of any secondary knowledge about the author, 
or the presumed context of the work. Next to this meticulous hermeneutic deciphering of single authoritative texts, structuralist efforts were undertaken to arrive at general conclusions, or rather assumptions, about the nature of literature, the specifics of Roman Jacobson's poetic code. Literary critics participated in this interpretive activity by providing the public with intelligent clues for its private reading and by legitimizing the complex autonomy of literature in contrast to the banality of the ordinary world. Devices, literariness, symbols, ambiguity and totality became the key words of this perspective on academic intelligent reading. Authorial intention, emotion, and recognition, on the other hand, were taboo words in academic papers. In the final analysis, the complexity of the literary text is often taken as the touchstone for its quality. In this respect, influential readers, we, are not only experts in their field, we produce important literature as well. Symptomatic for this cult of expert readership in the Netherlands was the appointment of the influential literary critic, E. Svens, in the 60s, as a professor of modern Dutch literature at the University of Nijmegen. Despite the fact that Svens had hardly ever published articles in so-called refereed or specialist journals and had not even written a dissertation, his literary reviews obviously proved his competence as an avid reader of literary texts, and that quality sufficed for his appointment. Today, Fenn's immense essayistic production would hardly qualify for a job as a temporary postdoc researcher. These premises were further elaborated and changed partly in the post-war neo-avant-garde and the hybrid version of postmodernism. But the essential role of literary studies as a hermeneutic discipline was not questioned fundamentally. Notwithstanding all sorts of differences, the majority of literary scholars still shared the underlying belief in literature, not only as an entity, but also as a value in its own right. Gradually, this orientation changed. First of all, Various voices questioned the neutrality of the canon, pleading in favor of the study of literature by minorities and popular literature. These new corpora entailed new methodological accents as well. Apart from sociological investigations and institutional perspective, traditional hermeneutics had to be complemented with insight from psychoanalysis, ideological criticism and deconstruction thus developing into a hermeneutics of suspicion. Yet even the deconstructionist strategy of demonstrating the rhetorical nature of the literature maintains the belief in literature as a unique means of signification. Nowadays, the debunking of aesthetic discourses and the overall call for society-related literature have influenced our discipline profoundly. Both the organization and the profile of literary studies have changed drastically in a desperate attempt to gain urgency and prestige in this evolving constellation. Some scholars plead in favor of a transformation of literary hermeneutics into cultural studies or cultural history, also at my university. Instead of limiting the object to mere texts or even abstract meanings, they tend to focus on the materiality of cultural objects and on the constitutive practices by which ideas and texts in and about literature are circulating and be negotiated. Yet, a cultural studies approach only takes a scant interest in the specific form and unique disturbing, discursive construction of literary objects, treating literary texts as mere documents or one type of cultural objects amongst many others. Other scholars nowadays consider it their main task to demonstrate the critical potential of literature and of literary scholarship by demonstrating how literary texts deal or refuse to deal with fundamental issues in society. In recent years, this has led to various fascinating perspectives, ranging from animal studies, I'm awaiting plant studies, or the Anthropocene to object-oriented approaches. 
Even more prominent are approaches which concentrate on the representation of gender and other dimensions of identity, on the problems of migration, often combining textual analysis with ethical or politically involved statements. Here as well, the interest for literature runs the risk of being first and foremost thematic and mimetic, reducing literature to its supposed message and function, and neglecting the structural, stylistic and discursive mechanisms underlying texts in their social-historical context. Or to put it even more radically, some studies offer brilliant material and sophisticated theoretical insights, but literary quotations are merely integrated in order to illustrate those general claims and critical comments. However understandable and laudable such recent interventions in literary studies may have been, they run the risk of further compromising the notion of literature. Many scholars are ashamed to discuss the canon instead of contemporary fashionable material. They are worried about the problematic ideology in most historical literature, and they hope to solve these issues by hiding literature in an overall institute for cultural studies, or else they opt for a much safer sociological or cognitive theoretical framework. Such strategies open up new possibilities for studying literary phenomena, but at the same time they flatten to be dominated by external factors, which will determine which types of literature can, must or must not be studied anymore, in what specific manners and with what aims. As a result, the discipline of literary studies runs the risk of simply dissolving itself. Personally, I believe that literary scholars should determine first and foremost the priorities of their own discipline. Our so-called crisis may be described not only in negative ways, as a mere catalogue of shortcomings and omissions, but also as an ambitious attempt to cope with the complexity of literature in our contemporary society. As such, impulses from other disciplines may be welcomed, but they cannot replace the identity of literary, literary studies as the study of literature. Literary texts are, in my opinion, still a major component of the practices and discourses that we want to analyze in depth. And therefore, the expertise of reading remains an essential, essential component of our formation as literary specialists. Understanding literary texts enables us to explain their success, the ongoing processes of circulation and negotiation throughout history, their actual impact in society in the past and the present. And these interpretative qualities will undoubtedly contribute to a better critical understanding of all kinds of semiotic processes in culture and in society. Whether reading expertly will turn us into better persons cannot be guaranteed. I think some people will probably still get wrong ideas. But I'm convinced that hermeneutic reading provides us not only with the necessary tools to lay bare meanings, ideological presuppositions, and even the unsaid in its constellations, reading also gives us a unique opportunity to combine immersion and rational distance, to identify and to remain an instance of the other, to grasp meaning while opening up to what is merely suggestive or what remains mysterious. In order to formulate this credo more straightforwardly, I present you some postulates which have oriented me in my own research. And you will notice I've been inspired by a large number of theoretical approaches, various frameworks from the tradition of hermeneutics, post-hermeneutics and critical hermeneutics, but also ideas from Foucault and critical discourse theories, and last but not least, from German systems theory. First of all, the domain of literary studies may be defined as literature. However, literature is not to be equated with a stable canon, but comprises a much larger corpus. Cultural hierarchies are crucial for its dynamics, and therefore the analysis of processes of canonization and marginalization constitutes a major topic of literary research, both diachronically and synchronically. To take this argument even a step further, Eventually, the boundaries between what is considered literary and what is supposed to fall outside the scope of literature 
are privileged domains of research as well. In other words, instead of an essentialist view on literature, I advocate a functionalist perspective. Literature is not. It is being constructed time and again by means of authoritative discourses and practices. In this respect, its material presentation is no mere coincidence, but an essential dimension of the ways in which literature is supposed to propagate its own identity. Secondly, the domain of literary research thus encompasses literary texts in the broadest sense. Neither the meaning nor the value of such texts, however, is a granted natural given, but remains to be analyzed. The so-called autonomy of literature is a normative position, but the same can be stated about the call for an involved or urgent literature. In other words, literary texts are no separate entity. They function in a complex context of discourses and practices. Consequently, conceptions about literature have to be analyzed as forms of legitimating and normative behavior rather than as mere descriptive and objective statements. And by the way, the same could be argued about literary theory as well. And thirdly, by stressing the importance of discourses and practices, it becomes clear that literary texts function in various constellations. Not only do they take their material, ideas, but also phrases and meanings from non-literary contexts, inversely, they also influence and construct their environments to a certain extent. Diagnoses such as tuberculosis and HIV were discovered on the basis of literary texts rather than on the basis of medical experiments. Consequently, the way in which external information is selected and integrated in literature constitutes a central dimension of literary discourse. Yet, this referential information is always being processed by its emergence in a specific literary context, even in the radical case of quotations or bare ready-mades. Literature models elements from reality by processes of selection and transformation. In this respect, not only the specific literary context in which new literary texts emerge should be taken into account, but also the relation of new texts with the genre, with literary tradition, and ultimately with the very idea of literature as such. To summarize these programmatic remarks, in my opinion, literary studies should focus especially on this double, Janus-faced identity of its object. Simultaneously fictional and truthful, imaginary and knowledge-centered, heteronomous and autonomous, literature and discourse. In the final part of my lecture, I would like to illustrate how, in my opinion, literary study still has its own selling position, not necessarily by abandoning its object and its formal methods, but rather by adapting these to deal better with the complex manifestation of contemporary literature. To this end, I will present to you a quartet of fascinating Dutch poets who each in their own way endeavor to cope with both the complexity of today's world and with the precarious status of poetry as a literary genre. The challenges contemporary poets are confronted with are multifold. Publishing poems is no longer self-evident, and as such, the posture of the author, la posture, has ranged drastically as well. Moreover, the choice between a more traditional stand or an avant-garde position is no longer an easy one. Both conceptions of literature have been criticized severely. On the one hand, the traditional conception, because of its conservative and antiquated means of expression, its invalid belief in universality, and its cult of individuality. On the other hand, the avant-garde poetics, because of its autonomous position, its hermetic use of language, and its failure to deal with concrete societal problems. And finally, the medium for transmitting poetic messages has changed fundamentally as well. Some poets still prefer the traditional poetry collection in fine printing, whereas others opt for a more performative interaction on stage or via social media. 
The authors I present today have opted deliberately for a certain eclectic approach. They all combine direct utterances, autobiographical utterances, with lyrical stylization. The belief in literature with the outspoken wish to discuss burning questions or ethical issues. The desire for emotional identification with a more detached, sometimes even clinical attitude. And finally, the ambition to combine elements from avant-garde writing with a more readable form of traditional lyricism. The result is a multi-faced poetics which could be called temperate modernist. A poetics which aims at continuing the dynamics of modernist and avant-garde poetry, but which at the same time hopes to achieve more readability and a greater social reference. My first example, Arno van Vlierbergen, belongs to a group of young militant poets in the Low Countries, together with colleagues such as Frank Keizer or Xavier Roelens, who want to bring urgent poetry to the fore again without, however, betraying the avant-garde autonomist poetics. Internationally speaking, these poets take their inspiration from American rap artists or the Russian avant-gardist performer Kirill Medvedev, but also from American language poetry and Kenneth Goldsmith's idea of constrained writing. Van Vlierberg operates both within literature and outside. He participates in collective initiatives and social protest, and, as a poet, he prefers to deliver his texts in pubs or on stage, close to his supporters or the younger generation he hopes to inspire. Yet, as a literary author, Van Vlierbergen distributes his texts preferably via literary highbro magazines. And his first poetry volume was published by Het Balancier, a small publisher who specializes in niche avant-garde literature. This deliberately ambivalent behavior is already reflected in the material appearance and the title of the book, Vloekschrift, something like Cursed Writing, a title unsuited for traditional lovers of literature. The printed book has an unusually large format and resembles sheep printing, not unlike the typical kind of pamphlets distributed for the good cause. Yet, it remains a literary publication, and even its blasphemous title may be related to polemical genres in literary history. I am bound on because I want the material to stick to your hands. Similar ambivalences dominate the poems. On the one hand, Van Vlierbergen opts for a traditional lyrical eye who reveals all kinds of anecdotes about his personal life, from love affairs to the routine of daily life or even his bank account. Yet this autobiographical contract is problematized in many ways. First of all, the eye can hardly be considered exemplary or a model for other people, quite on the contrary. Moreover, this eye is no longer capable of controlling his own discourse, let alone of taking control over his own life. The lyrical eye, as a self-conscious subject, is literally marginalized. It is lacking in many poems, and in other instances it is idolized, very vague or ambiguous. The unique eye is thus deconstructed as an illusionary entity. Nothing but a series of endless informative and performative discursive statements. Moreover, the eye is observed and analyzed from an outside perspective, as if it were described and even constituted by a multitude of surveillance cameras. The fact that the speaker refers to himself not only as I, but also in the third person, as an impersonal, impersonal it, or by means of a common noun, I am un Arno instead of I am Arno, reinforces this feeling of uncanniness. As a consequence, the poems hover between a misleading personal expression and a tentative analysis of the way in which subjects are constructed and used by hegemonic structures and by the late capitalist order. The subsequent sections of the volume, as you can see, are indeed called the zone, the situation, and the method titles which stress the clinical, almost scientific nature of these analyses. 
In the course of these litany-like curses, a real catalog of problems is mentioned in order to demonstrate the cancers undermining our Western society. And I quote only a few of those. The internet and porn, the migration crisis, political conflicts and vulgar populism, the growing intolerance, the disastrous effects of globalization and the climate change, and so on. Yet these issues are relegated to the margin of the poetic discourse as well. Presumably, the world has lost its central perspective too. What rests is nothing but a labyrinth, a rizzo, a discursive flow in which the body of the eye tries desperately to stay alive, as a voice amidst the overwhelming noises of society and technology. The only way to get heard nowadays is by speaking up and cursing. My second example tries to deal with these insisting issues in a more explicitly poetic manner, by taking recourse to the established literary frames, yet broadening those both formally and thematically. In her poetry collection, The Oxels van de Bok, The He Goes Armpits, In her poetry collection, The Oxels van de Bok, Anna-Marie Estor attempts to construct a new feminist epic by establishing a hybrid universe. To that end, gods and creatures from various backgrounds, Western mythology but also Arabic and African stories, are mingled with motifs from the Bible and the hermetic tradition of the Kabbalah. All these elements are used to evoke the passionate love story between the satyr, Isem, a preacher whose name is the Kabylian word for lion, and the woman, Mealara. A new barrack epoch is created, which discusses explicitly the complex relation between men and women, between nature and culture, between the subject and the other, between animals, gods, and humans, from a contemporary activist point of view. In her most recent poetry volume, Niemands Land Nacht, literally no Man's Country Night, Esther continues this fervent search for new literary forms in order to discuss today's issues. This time, she combines her Baroque imagery and her rhetorical pathos with narrative patterns which have been borrowed from popular literature. On the one hand, the detective story, on the other hand, fantasy literature. The collection indeed reads as a variation on the well-known apocalyptic fantasy story with the hero traveling around in an attempt to find her own identity and her place in a strange world. In this particular case, the main character is a young woman, Pili, who lives in the perfect city Orb. At first sight, Orb seems the realization of a utopian dream. But the perfect order and harmony are very treacherous. The inhabitants are controlled permanently by means of cameras and sophisticated computer programs. If they misbehave or act instinctively, they will be reprogrammed and ultimately murdered by the repressive but entirely anonymous regime. However, gradually, Billy discovers the repressed truth behind the idle varnish. She moves to the uncanny suburbs, an underworld called Rout, where many outcasts live in a disorderly, lawless, but at the same time very free and creative manner. Here, she discovers a terrible personal truth. She has a family who fled from Orb in a desperate attempt to save their lives, since they were not considered fit for the clean and perfect society. Not surprisingly, in this apocalyptic universe, a happy end is out of the question. Pity will not be able to escape from the ultimate control, and she will be removed from society, to use the euphemisms which the Orb regime is so fond of. In this collection of poetic fragments, the reader moves from seeming realism to grotesque fiction. The opposition between Grout and Orb resembles in many respects the challenges most metropoles are confronted with nowadays. Migration and multiculturality, the omnipresence of Big Brother in a high technological world, the massive problems of climate change and waste, the loss of a collective identity. All these themes are touched upon in a recognizable narrative pattern, 
which is, however, disturbed radically in order to avoid naive realism and easy empathy from, from the part of the reader. Some actions remain incomplete or ambiguous, and many riddles cannot be solved on the basis of textual material. Moreover, the closed textual universe is opened up not only to introduce social problems, but also to a multitude of allusions to popular fiction, to Dante's Hell and Eliot's Wasteland, to movies and so on. Thus, the reading experience is at the same time stimulated and complicated. A similar hesitation between a traditional and a modernist literary practice lies at the heart of my third example, the poetic oeuvre of Pieter Brandy, who is not only a prolific writer of poetry, reviews and essays, but also a scholar and translator of ancient Greek and Latin literature and philosophy. Voluminous book, Steen Circles, Stone Circles, Gerbrandi explores the ways in which the genre of the age old epic can be revitalized in order to cope with today's complex and, in certain respects, disastrous reality. The title, Stone Circles, refers to enigmatic patterns of stones, which you can see on the front page, which can be found in rural landscapes, material rests which inevitably provoke all kinds of questions. Are these circles nothing but coincidental rocks left behind by rivers or glaciers in prehistoric time? Or are we supposed to recognize marks from an early civilization, just like Stonehenge, for instance? As such, Gerbrandi's title both highlights the modernist meta-literary concentration on the writing process, deciphering science, and the age of the Anthropocene, humankind constituting no more than an unimportant intermezzo in the history of the planet Earth and the cosmos. It is quite intriguing how this marginalization of humankind goes together with an ambitious belief in the poetic voice. On the one hand, the entire text shows the voice of an omniscient narrator typical for the genre of the classic epic, who not only comments upon the actions and descriptions, but also clearly embellishes particular scenes in order to demonstrate his brilliant style or to introduce supplementary narrative and symbolic meanings. It is no coincidence that Gerbrandi's book, as you can see, is divided into five sections, complemented by a prologue and an epilogue, a clear echo of the tragedy, that other prestigious genre in literature. On the other hand, however, the illusion of a coherent and rational text is deconstructed radically by the way in which the poem is fragmented and spatialized. Each subsection contains poems which are sometimes but not always numbered, and various letter fonts, as you can see, are mingled on each page. Moreover, the poet quotes mottos in Greek and Latin, incomprehensible for many readers, and on top of these complex paratextual strategies, each page concludes with an isolated line, which can be combined with others into a new linear text. Yet, Herbrandi transcends this modernist poetics by offering the reader at the same time a recognizable story, which moreover is concentrated on the vicissitudes of a central character, who is introduced explicitly as the hero of the story. His name, however, is nothing but the letter O, an initial perhaps a reference to the legendary travel odysseus, but also an empty home instead of a fixed identity and a circle. In the beginning of the story, O decides to leave civilization in search of unspoiled, primitive nature. His quest entails not only the shift from culture to nature, but also the shift from hasty activity to sociability and passivity from an energetic towards a more reflective way of life. To achieve this, all tracks of humankind, for instance, modern means of transport and technological gadgets, have to be abandoned. In the end, O arrives in a biting landscape of snow and silence, presumably situated in Siberia. In these natural, primitive surroundings, the hero is confronted with the mysteries of shamanism and an altogether other in human way of life, exemplified by his brief erotic encounter 
with several strong women. Yet the initial paradoxes are never solved. When leaving, O is asked to pay for his stay in Siberia in American dollars, not even Russian rubles. Despite all ideals and all deals, the ultimate imprint of capitalism and culture cannot be denied at all, it seems. This eco-political dimension of the poem is thus integrated in the symbolic narrative of an existential fit de passage. In this respect, the meticulous reader will not only notice the multifold references to all kinds of contemporary threats, ranging from endangered animal species to political and military conflicts, natural disasters, exploding airplanes, and so on, but also the deep familiarization of homely spaces. A weekday visit to the sauna, for instance, is transformed into a kind of cosmic and mystic yoga experience. The lamps become stars and the ceiling is a heaven. And accordingly, the vapor is evoked as a magic symphony of orders which purifies O from his earthly worries. Thus, the universes of myth, imagination and reality are melted together. Inversely, the romantic mystic nature, as it is worshipped by ecologists, is problematized as well. In fact, the natural and the so-called inhuman are no less human constructs than cultural and technological inventions. In this manner, Gerbrand refuses easy criticism and elegant answers, and instead provides the reader with sets, large sets of rhetorical questions which remain unanswered. To quote only a few lines, do we have to treat cows in a human manner? Did she have an orgasm? Is poetry a mere playground for losers? In other words, for Gebrandi, the search in itself prevails over establishing answers. Meticulous reading and rereading is considered more important than finding truths. Philosophical doubt is in the end more fundamental than all sorts of prefabricated beliefs. Yet, the poet also hopes to achieve truth and some action in the world, unlike his postmodern precursors. In my last example, whereas Gerbrandi stresses the ambivalences of rhetoric and rationality, his young female colleague, Dominique de Groen, I mentioned the fact that she is female because Dominique is a male and a female name in a Dutch context, Dominique de Groen opts for a much more explicitly engaged way. In her debut collection of poems entitled Shop Girl, the use of the English language is in itself already significant, she offers her readers critical analysis of the globalized clothing industry by taking the sheep shops of Primark as a typical symptom of our capitalist post Fordian economics and commerce. As a matter of fact, the publishing house, once more Hut Valancier, presents the booklet as a kind of commercial object subjected to the logic of capitalist economics. The title is accompanied by the logo R, which identifies commercial trademarks. And the ISBN identification code is printed in a large font on the front page as well. The message towards the reader is clear. This is not, or not only symbolic literature, but a genuine object, real capital. The Groen presents her readers with eight long poems, which describe the complex yet very perverse mechanisms underlying the clothing industry in a worldwide context. This so-called objective structural analysis from an outspoken Marxist and Anthropocene point of view, however, is intertwined once again with autobiographical statements and lyrical fragments. Once more, this intriguing combination of an avant-garde writing attitude with a rather traditional presentation of the lyrical eye may be considered typical for today's Dutch poetry. As a matter of fact, the almost clinical tone and the sometimes very abstract formulations in Shop Girl are countered not only by the performances in which the public can literally meet the groom in person, but also by the photographic images of the poet and her insistence in all interviews that her poetry is based on actual experiences, a six-month period during which the poet used to work in one of the Primark shops. Whether she occupied that job 
deliberately for her poetical research, like investigative journalist Günter Baurav, or only to gain some quick money, remains unclear. In her poetic research, the Grund stresses the mechanical nature of working in the clothing industry, which not only turns it into an anomalous uh, activity, but which even resembles the chain of inevitable actions and reactions in chemistry. The poet's deliberately clinical tone turns her into a kind of laboratory worker or scientist, someone who analyzes and decomposes materials in order to get insight into their basic components. This results in a stereotypical discourse where brief fragments and impressions link together in a seemingly unpassionate and mechanical way. The tone is monotonous and some fragments are repeated several times in order to stress the boring routine, but also the ultimate lack of initiative and control of the lyrical eye. In fact, this subject is hardly ever evoked as a real person with emotions and a will of her own, but rather as a machine of organs and body parts. Inversely, the supply chain is personified, as if it were a living creature of its own, thus subverting the traditional oppositions between living and lifeless, and between subject and object. This paradoxal in-between situation is quite puzzling for the reader, who cannot decide which fragments are to be taken literally as realist descriptions, and which utterances are to be interpreted as visions, imaginations, or poetic symbols. When the eye ends her shift as a worker, she undresses. But as she takes off her black uniform, she also loses her body, since the uniform has become an essential second skin. Moreover, the activity of undressing gets transformed into an analytical activity which undoes the clothing fabrication process. The buttons become seashells once again, the cotton thread becomes the wool of exotic animals, and the cloth is not only linked to a factory in Bangladesh, but also to its chemical components, plastics, and ultimately oil. Plastics are reminiscent ultimately of the desert sand, whereas oil, commonly called the black gold of the desert, starts to dissolve into raw materials and chemicals, ending up with the cosmic black hole. Thus, the mechanical labor is intertwined with the geological origins of our world and with the capitalist oppression of people in the Far East. In a similar way, the human eye is reinterpreted in chemical terms and participates in a global cosmic connection. The poet thus chooses to bombard us with disparate images, which oblige the reader to a thorough reflection on fundamental forces in our world. The use or rather misuse of natural resources, the excesses of consumerism and capitalism, the alienation of technology and mechanization, which threatens the very existence of humans in a post-human universe. By tackling these questions in a literary manner, the Groen once again struggles with the basic double bind situation which we are constantly confronted with. We cannot escape from language itself in order to take a lucid, objective, non-human stand. And yet this very same language provides us with the only means to analyze reality in a less intuitive, more general and especially critical Ladies and gentlemen, at the end of this lecture, many things remain even more unclear than before. But that's one of our major tasks, I think, in society. Most of the ideas are formulated, in fact, need much more reflection, much more theoretical reasoning and much more detailed research. Some of my arguments probably sounded too unfashionable, too conservative, or on the other hand, too revolutionary. In the final analysis, my point of view seems thus related uncannily, unheimlich, to the double bind I just indicated. In fact, our scholarly activities cannot be considered independently of what is going on in literature itself, in culture and in the society we are forced to live in. Our struggle for a better understanding of the precarious relationship between autonomy and heteronomy reflects the loss of Lager's evident prestige in recent times. Our need 
to develop contextual approaches is generated also by the priorities in society. Yet, this situation need not be interpreted in a desperate way. Literature has been a crucial component of culture for many centuries, and its relative marginalization does not alter this observation in a radical manner. Quite on the contrary, our daily fascination with literary phenomena offers us unique opportunities to grasp the complex relation, the complex reality of practices, discourses, and objects, their ongoing circulation and negotiation processes, their search for meanings, but also their dreams of changing writers and readers, of becoming better persons in a better universe. Who in the world would want to abandon such a marvelous journey? I think. <laughs>